Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Noreen. And I'm an alcoholic. And I'm shivering in my voice already. I have my story to offer you, and that's all I have. I am not a big, elaborate speaker. I, I am I'm just honestly a member of Alcoholics Anonymous who happens to have people who live here in Connecticut who are doing things that love me and have had, they tell me I have impacted their life in a, in a positive way. So what I have to offer you tonight is simply what Alcoholics Anonymous and what my story is. Okay? So given that, can we reduce the level of expectation? (laughs) Okay. Now I feel a little better. (laughs) I um I was born in New England. I'm actually um, from Massachusetts. I was born and raised in South Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. Irish, Catholic, Democrat, alcoholic. I mean, all of these things are really important in my family. <laughs> okay? That's, you know, I'm not saying everybody here is, Democrat, but in my family, that's the way it was, you know. So again, I'm telling my story. I'm not saying you should be anything. Um, but you know, so I grew up in this home and, um, I grew up in it in South Boston. I grew up in a street where, um, most of the families were pretty much the same. And what happened? They had houses where the grandparents lived upstairs and one of the kids' family lived downstairs and that was pretty much the way it was and if there was if there were three levels in the home often there was two families related you know so there was lots of and my mother my mother grew up on the same street she was raised actually born in the house I was raised in um from what I see you know in talking to people that's not that's not kind of the norm anymore. But I grew up in it. I I really did grow up in a, in a na- neighborhood. It was it, it was one of those kind of old, um, really kind of. My grandparents all came from Ireland, so I mean my family is relatively new here. <laughs> you know, I mean really, and um, my grandparents lived upstairs. We lived downstairs, and uh, I went to the local school, the Catholic school, and I went there from kindergarten through eighth grade, and I went to uh, an all-girls Catholic academy, young, Mount St. Joseph Academy for young Catholic women. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I want you to know that despite what might have to all appearances, you know, to be a place that you would feel secure and loved and cared for. I got the love part, but believe me, I did not feel secure. I did not know how to act. I had fear in me from the beginning. Um, I was also um, told pretty early on I was rather bright. Bad news. Well, because then I thought I knew better, right? I knew better than my parents knew. You know, and when I shared what I thought was the better way with them, I was so surprised that they didn't do what I suggested. (laughs) And that's, I mean, that's real. That was like, I don't understand. I mean, why wouldn't you? I, I didn't, I just didn't get it. Um, but here's something else. In a neighborhood that, uh, that is relatively 
um, it appears anyway, in a neighborhood that people formed relationships that were lifelong and, you know, had all the, you know, just knew each other and were best friends and got through all the stuff. That was not me. I lived in South Boston from the time I was born and the time, till the time I was 18 years old. And there was not one person, not one, that I called friend. There was not one person that when I left Boston, that when I was coming home to Boston, that I would have to call. I was lonely and isolated and didn't know what to do. I saw people around. You know, I had I had um, a sister and two brothers. They have friends that have had since they were kids. We grew up in the same household. Okay, we grew up in the same household, and basically you're given essentially the same stuff. I must have missed what was given out. You know, I was too busy thinking I knew or something. I don't know, you know. I can tell you also that in that household I grew up in, we had alcoholism. We had incest. Um, it was a great one for don't let the neighbors know. Uh, there was always the potential for violence. Not always violence, but I lived with the fear, that tension that comes with that kind of household, that any minute now, you know. So since I was the oldest, somewhere in there I thought I knew, right? And that um, I was the one that stood up to my father. Everybody else in the household had enough sense. <laughs> Not me. Because when he was wrong, I wanted to make sure he understood he was wrong and where he was wrong. So from the beginning, I was a toe-to-toer. If, you know, it's like I stepped up to the plate. Uh, my mother disappeared. You know, my sister and brothers knew enough to go elsewhere. Not me. Now, in addition to having that, because I was that way, there was this weird kind of twisty thing that goes along with some of that sometimes. That became my father had some kind of respect for me, which could be really kind of weird, you know, because they don't like you stepping up and telling them where they're wrong. But at the same time, they're so proud of you that they did, that you did, you know, and it's like, how does this fit? I w- uh, my time in, I was good in school. I told you that. I'll just tell you a little about that stuff, you know. And I also believe that it's important that you also know that I was sexually assaulted by a gang of guys when I was 12 years old. Now, some people go, what's that got to do with it? I just want you to know that kind of is peace of what and how I was and the experiences I have, because that's all I have to, to offer you. You know what I mean? That stuff happened to me. One of the one of the kids was my own first cousin. You know, I mean, and and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, and I stayed home for a while. And I kind of hid in my room and I read. I was a reader. I'm the I'm the kid that read all the encyclopedias. Okay, you know what I mean? And that's what I mean. Everything I could get my hands on, I read. And um, and that was kind of what filled information. Information was interesting to me. And, of course, it also took me out of where I was. You know, I didn't have to live in this, this fear, and I could be somewhere else. I could think about other things. I could have this information come in, and it felt good. You know, that felt comforting to me. Um, even today, books are comforting to me. And I use the, all the electronic stuff, but there's something about books. I love libraries, old bookstores. So it's like, I can, it's like going into an AA meeting sometimes. I just get a little sense of, you know, because I get that when I come to AA, right? 
So I, at age 12, I started uh, smoking dope. There was alcohol in the family. I really didn't do much of that. They put it on my gums as a kid. You know, I mean, that's the kind of family I grew up in. But I, I didn't drink. I didn't do anything purposefully with that stuff myself, okay, until I, I did things backwards, people tell me. So I smoked dope first. Then I drank. And then I smoked cigarettes, tobacco cigarettes. <laughs> it's a little backwards, but, you know, they all got in there. Um, so think of that. Who I was, how old I was, what was going on, my fears, trying to seek comfort. I was also overweight. And being overweight was unacceptable in my family, especially for the girls. So I am of a certain age. I'm 61. I don't care if you know. I'm 61. So I'm of this age. What they did is they took my mother, took me to the fat doctor. Anybody remember fat doctors? So you go to the fat doctor and they give you medicine. Well, that medicine made me move fast. (laughs) Yeah. They gave me pills, little black pills, and they gave me a shot. I mean, you know. And I, I also was a kid that had illnesses. I had allergies. I had, I had a disease called viral encephalitis. It was, it's a virus in your brain, and I was in a coma. For all of this stuff is kind of the stuff that happened as a kid, you know. And so I'm the oldest. I had all this medication. I took care of my own medication. That's when I found out that you could mix and match things. And when you did that, you felt different things. I didn't know about feeling myself much. You know what I mean? I kind of was like just fearful. Now, the appearance might not have been one of fear. If you looked at me, you probably didn't think I was afraid. You know? Um, But I was. That was a constant for me. And in some way, I was always seeking solution for that. Uh, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and I have resentment with them. I was not, you know, eventually, you know, we have, thank goodness for a higher power of my understanding, because they weren't going to let me be Pope. I didn't want to be a member. (laughs) Hey, I'm being flat out honest. You know, because uh, when you think about it, I was raised, you know, starting to be raised in the 50s, but then the 60s happened, okay? And I'm just kind of growing up, and I'm starting to see all this stuff go on, and it's sex, drugs, rock and roll, revolution, civil rights, women's lib, anti-war, because I was anti-war. Um, you'll hear a little more about that a little later. Um, but, you know, that was what it was. It was exciting. And, you know, I grew up in this democratic family okay and the reason I say that again is because see it was political and I, it was so easy for this alcoholic for this person that I was to just take a step further to the left I mean we can go any any way I happen to go I went right that time we'll go left <laughs> so anyway I thought I said oh, anyway But you get the idea. It was just very easy to take a further action. I was also a kid, right? So at kids, you're risk takers, you're doing us. I'm doing all that stuff. And I and I went to to high school. I told you where I went to high school. And here you got. I laughed today. I laughed today because the the uniforms we were. Now mind you, this is now I'm in this. I'm still in high school in the in the 60s. I graduated in 1969. In 1969. I graduated from a school that we wore the postulants uniform, okay? It just didn't fit with the mini skirts and the, all the other stuff that was going on. Let me tell you, you know, I'm in this navy blue thing. We had bought common pants. I was like, talk about not fitting in, you know, and being in these different worlds, you know? Um, because my mother wouldn't go with my father places, I was his date a lot, so I also learned how to be out with people, and I, I, I had relationships, not sexual ones, but I had relationships in communication with a lot of older folks, and I was really fascinated because they listened to what I had to say. You know, that was interesting to me, that they did listen. 
Um, at least I felt like they did. I didn't have anyone else that listened to me. I didn't have, you know, I look back, I didn't have a best girlfriend. I, um, and when I tr- tried having boyfriends, that didn't work very well either. Um, so I, I had this best buddies, worst enemies kind of relationship with my father. And um, my dad ran for office. And um, as a matter of fact, some of you may know something about some of the family members that my father, uh, my father ran against Billy Bulger in his very first, this true story, <laughs> Billy Bulger in his very first political run. So there's my dad and Billy Bulger and the brother Whitey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Whitey showed up <laughs> and, um, there were some things that happened, like there were some guns, and there was a burnt-down headquarters and a variety of things. Yes, yes. So I had some experience with that. And the kid, you know, when people talk about gangs and neighborhoods and things like that, you know, I, I felt relatively safe in my neighborhood in, in a weird way, right? Because you know, you heard the things that happened, right? But I felt, but yet the kid down the street killed the kid across the street. You know, so I grew up with that kind of stuff around me, and it was just kind of normal. That was a normal kind of thing. Was it every day? No. Did I hear the gunshots of that happening? No, I did not. Um, So life went on. I graduated from high school, went to college for a year, didn't do so well. I, I just, I couldn't think clearly. I couldn't take, I could hear what they were saying, but I just, I had so much fear that I could talk to you about stuff, but I couldn't write it. I don't, it's not I had a disability in that sense. You know, I didn't have a clearly defined, I I couldn't get it together to put it down on a piece of paper. So I don't know about any of you all, but so my first year at school was really a party. I mean, I learned all about all kinds of other things. And, and yeah, it's like sex for the first time willingly, you know, that I actually was saying, yeah, I think I'll do this. Um, I, I learned about hallucinogens. I learned about alcohol. That's, you know, that, and then I learned about more political things that were going on. And I got active in that, but I couldn't keep and maintain my grades, and I failed that that year. And my parents came to the school to surprise me. Not a good deal. They found things I wrote in my, my room. I wasn't there. I was listening to some guy that was talking about um, birth control on the... <laughs> somewhere, and they arrived, and it was not pretty. Um, That's kind of the person I was, you know what I mean? That's the things that happened to me and kind of the things that made up who I am and and all of that. So then I um, I had a fight with my father. If he didn't do things differently, (laughs) I love the way you, but I do think of it. If he wouldn't do things differently, then I was going to leave. Well... He didn't do things differently, so I left. I, I had um, gone into Boston, got a job, did all this stuff for a short period of time, didn't like what he was doing, had a fight with him, got my purse, my purse, and all of the $35 I had in a bank account. Met some people in the Boston Common and took off hitchhiking. And I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no plan. And I will tell you that even in recovery, sometimes I had no plan. You know, I didn't know where I was going to go or what was going to happen. I can tell you what I took with me was me, that fearful, scared, resentful problems in the area of relationship person that I was, that what I did was add things to it. I arrived in Cincinnati, Ohio. Not my intention. I was definitely looking for something further west. So I end up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, the very first place I sat down in was um, 
the Cincinnati Free Clinic. Now, this was a time when there was um, very active community with the free clinic, and they were looking because there was no public health system at the time in, in um, really in, in, in Cincinnati. So the free clinic was a place where the, the kids could come and get treated for their STDs and maybe talk, they have a rap group and, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. They did blood work, and they did that stuff for free. Um, so that's where I ended up. And I was there for a little bit, and then somebody took me aside. And I lived on the street. I was a street kid. I got my meals by begging at, you know, if, call it begging, call it asking, call it requesting, whatever you will. But I went to the McDonald's and whatever there was there, and at, they don't do they won't do this stuff anymore. But <laughs> I would ask them what they had left over. You know what I mean? So I made sure I, so I got fed. You know, or I bummed um, a place to stay um, with people. I didn't have a regular place to stay for a long time, you know. Um, so you might say I was one of the homeless. I was, because I didn't have a home. I didn't have a visible means of support. And yet there I was. It was a time that, that you could stay with other people. You did things. There was a little bit more of a community atmosphere at that time for that stuff. So I did that. And I got involved. And I, and I um, became a part of a, a group of people that were doing um, the underground newspaper. And I became a part of the people that were, that were doing the health care stuff. And I was, became a part of the people that were doing... Um, a switchboard so that when people came, you know, didn't know where to go or what to do, the resources. So I got a, to be a part of that. And for me, that, that helped me a lot because I felt like I was helping others. There was something to me that even back then was magic, magic about helping someone else. I didn't know how to help myself. I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't know how to be real or honest or upfront or any of those things with anyone else. But I knew I knew somewhere inside me how it felt to be able to help somebody else. So that's what I wanted to do. And I got involved in that, and I did that. And I didn't want people hurt, so I became part of the, you know, anti-war. And I just, you know, and I'm not trying to be political up here. I'm sharing what I did. You know what I mean? It's like, this is who and what I was and what Alcoholics Anonymous got. So I spent my life going here to there, trying to have relationships. They failed. I, my relationships involved with other people were, were um, often volatile. That would be a nice way to put it. Um, yeah, I like that word. I think that's it. Volatile. Yeah. Um, I just didn't know how to not get involved in relationships with others that could actually be kind or caring. And let me tell you, there were people in my life that came into my life that were those things. I was such a damaged person that I could not tolerate kind, loving people in my life and here's the alcoholic thinking if they are with me I might do something to hurt them or they might get hurt because of that I cannot tolerate your love your kindness your care so I'll do what I can to get rid of you and that's what I proceeded to do. I pushed any potential partner away that had any kindness because I knew how to be with people who were violent. I knew how to be with people who, who you know, the domestic violence stuff, who, who fought with you. I knew how to do that. I knew how to do that. And here's the thinking with that. If I hurt them, they're nasty anyway. So why should that bother me, right? So that's the thinking. Why should it bother me if they're mean, they deserve to get it, 
You know what I mean? So it's that kind of thinking. I didn't deserve it. They deserved it so that it'd work out. So I could be with people that were mean, but I could not be with somebody that had any kindness. Um, they scared me. You know that fear that I talked about? I was scared. I was so scared. Could not tolerate it. Wanted it. Wanted it. Would feel like, um, I don't know if anybody's had this experience, but, but I felt so many times in my life like there was a glass pane, like I was inside the house, the glass pane, and I was watching other people have a life. I watched them have it. I could see them have friendships and have, you know, go through school and, and form relationships and be happy and have families and, I mean, do all this stuff. And I was watching from the window, but I could not participate in it. There was something, you know, that was stopping me from my ability to connect. That's what I see. Impossible. Inability to form and develop relationships with other human beings. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous got. That person. And I continued on and I went out west. I did end up out west. I did all kinds of things and I tried to have relationships with other people and none of them were successful. None of them. Men, women, I tried both. Okay? And none of it, none of those relationships fixed me. None of those relationships allowed me to be okay. None of them. I carried me, my fear, my anger, my resentment, my hurt, my inability to be honest, my inability to be open with me into whatever relationship I was in. I ended up back in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I had this other resentment thing that was going on that I carried from when I was a kid. It was this. When I was a kid, I was the one in the family that put everything together. I was mechanically inclined. I was good at that stuff. I was good at spatial things. I could do that. I knew how to use tools. And they would not let me go to the school for that because I was a girl. (laughs) I want you to know that was a burning resentment. Well... I had an opportunity in Cincinnati, and the opportunity was this. I got to be the first woman in the, was then the general hospital, now the university hospital, in the maintenance department as an electrician. I lost that job because of my alcoholism. Yeah, I was there, I did the deal, I showed up, and then I went out with the guys after, and I was climbing in people's windows at night because I didn't, couldn't get home, and I, I mean, you know, this is the kind of stuff I did. I, I, I couldn't not do it, and I will tell you that everything in me wanted to be so perfect, so that all women carried on my shoulder, you know, all women could do these jobs, right? I did. I wanted it so bad. And I failed miserably. And the guilt and the shame of that that I carried, you know, because all of these things that I'm doing and, and the, the relationships I'm having and the things that I'm trying and the one night stands and the, all this stuff that's going on and this mismatch of drinking and vomiting and, and, and the things that we do. You know, I had acid flashbacks. I was in the fetal position. No, it's in the fetal position in my bedroom. You know, it wasn't acid flashbacks. It was alcohol withdrawal. I didn't know I was having the DTs. I got that sick. I couldn't not drink. I couldn't not. Sometimes I put other substances, but I could not not drink. I had, 
I couldn't remember what I had done or where I was supposed to be or who I had been with or what I had said or where my clothes were. <laughs> you know, if any of you were here last night, Howard talked about not having his underwear. <laughs> I related to Howard. <laughs> I did. I did. I was like, huh, my kind of guy. <laughs> I know how that is. It's like, what happened? What? You know, yeah. Yeah. I actually had an incident in, when I was living in San Francisco where I went to the bar, drank. They thought I was too out of control. Put me very nicely. Put me in a cab, sent me home. I came back. <laughs> they put me in another cab, sent me home. I came back again. This time they took me home, took all my clothes. I'm talking about not having clothes because they took all my clothes off and locked me in my room. There's no windows in that room at the time. So it was like, yeah, okay, I know how that is. I know waking up with that degradation. I know the feeling of doing things and experiencing things and not the shape. For me, sometimes it wasn't what I did was so bad. It's what I thought I did that was so bad because I didn't want to ask anyone what I had done. And I didn't want them telling me because I knew it was horrible. I just knew it was just the worst. That's who Alcoholics Anonymous got. When I had that job at Cincinnati as the electrician, I got so afraid. I got so afraid that I could not answer my door. I could not answer my phone, and I could not Open my mail. I know what fear can do. I knew there was something desperately wrong with me, but I did not know it was alcoholism. I thought I was crazy because I knew it was crazy. I had worked in psychiatric facilities. I knew what crazy was, and I knew I was behaving that way because it doesn't make sense not to be able to do those things. I mean, you have this logical mind that's kind of watching you do these things, you know, and, and observing it and going, that's not right. Yeah, it's not. What am I going to do? I don't know how to do something about this. I've tried. This is what I've tried, you know. And any of you all have that, I mean, that ongoing conversation never stops, always has various opinions, never just one, about all the things that are going on in alcoholism. It's alcoholism. You know, it's alcoholism. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go to the psychiatrist. Because I'm crazy, right? That's what you do. This is 1980. My sobriety date is April 25th, 1980. It makes me 33 years sober. And I am one of those people. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just one of those people that have been blessed since the first day she came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been able to, to not drink. I've, I've been able to put one foot in front of the other despite all kinds of things. Because life happens to us all in all kinds of ways. You know, I'm that person that came in and um, despite my fear, I was t- Terrified. I was absolutely terrified. I thought they were going to turn me into my Uncle John. <laughs> Uncle John was not nice. Some of us in AA are not good big books. And he was not, but he didn't drink. And I knew there was a solution. And I went to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist says to me, Well, if you can't go to work tomorrow, you know. We'll put you in the psych ward. So that's where I went. Because if you're anything like me, if nothing changes, nothing changes, and nothing changed other than he said, if you can't, there's nothing new in that. So the next day I was still terrified. I couldn't do these things. He put me in the psych ward. I was in the psych ward for some time. While I was there, I was such a model of a patient. Um, 
somebody cheeked their medicine and gave them to me and asked me to hold them for them. (laughs) They came back looking for them. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) They were already gone. In me. There was a nurse there that I knew about some activities she was having with somebody else. So I tried to use and manipulate that information. I, um, but here's what ultimately, despite all of that insanity, which is insanity, and they gave me medication. And at the time, they didn't have a lot of the the stuff that is seemingly helpful to some of us today, they had things like Thorazine and Melorel. (laughs) So they gave me that. And every time I would get out of bed, (laughs) now you have to imagine me in this really bright, red, thick, long, too long for how tall I am, robe. They would give me the medication. I would be, okay, time to get up. I'd get out of bed, and I'd go down like... <laughs> it took every bit of blood pressure right out of me. It was sort of like the, the, you know, the Wizard of Oz and the Wicked Witch melting. <laughs> Boom, she's down on the ground again. What I liked about being in the psych ward, I will tell you, is that I didn't have to talk to anybody I didn't want to talk. Boy, was that a safe place. I have to tell you, for the first time in my life I got a little glimpse of somebody was protecting me and I was safe. I didn't feel that really anywhere else. I didn't feel that really. So the big news was when my mother called I didn't have to answer and talk to her. I loved that. I absolutely loved that. My poor mother. God love her. Yeah. It's like I don't want to talk to her. Okay. Hey, I liked that. I liked it. I got three meals a day. Um, I got to do arts and crafts. <laughs> you know, I mean, there were some positive things I was getting out of this place. Well, the psychiatrist. Remember him? He took me. He said, tell me what your problems are. And uh, I was afraid. So he said, fear can work for you. It worked for me. I didn't know it was going to work for me, but fear can work for you. What happened is I was so afraid that he was going to kick me out. And by the way, while I was in the psych ward, I lost my job. I lost my place of living. So I lost everything. So I had nothing. I was, again, homeless, and it was all zero. You know, I had a, an acquaintance growing up. Her, and her, her father used to describe all her boyfriends as big zeros. They were just big zeros. That's who I I felt like Mr. Electon was pointing at me and saying, you're nothing but a big zero. I mean, that's, maybe some of y'all relate to that. That's my mind. That's how that worked. I I could feel that. I could see that. I could visualize him doing that and looking at me. I have self-centered fear, would you say, a little bit, you know? So, alcohol was on the list. And by the way, I had been honest with my doctor. I love how honest we are, right? At least me. I'll speak for myself. Me. Because I told him I had had a problem with drugs. Never mentioned alcohol. And had had was really a lie, too. So, I write this list. Because you know as well as I do, right, when we get him... Here, we don't have a problem. We have problems. Yes. So there were multiple, and it was on the list. And all these things, and I can't even tell you, you know, all of the things that were on the list, the unmanageability was was rampant in my life. But this doctor looks at me and says, oh, you have alcohol on the list. I'm going to give you a pass to Alcoholics Anonymous. He gave me a pass. He gave me the number. I had to call you. So I call you. 
And this is 1980, and I know we're very tech-savvy and all of this, but at that time, they were just starting to make those phones that had those little buttons on them so you could get multiple, you know. And the person who was answering their phone did not know how to use it. Okay? I mean, okay. This is, you know. So she hung up on me. I had to call back. So I got that lesson really early before you even told me about being willing to keep doing things. You know, I I had a call back. I called back and this woman came to the psych ward to get me. Now, she was about this tall. From the brown hair. She was tiny. She was tiny. Her name was Donna. And I'll tell you something. She came by herself, which is not something that they recommend. She came, she asked for me, I came out, and I remember thinking, some of the things we think are so funny, I mean, and I clearly still remember this. I remember looking at her and thinking, isn't she lucky? I know. Isn't she lucky that she's coming to pick me up? Somebody else might hurt her. (laughs) Go figure, that's the kind of level of thinking and the stuff that I had going on in my head at the time. She picks me up, she takes me to this place, 405 Oak Street. 405 Oak Street in Cincinnati is the oldest um, clubhouse in, um, anywhere in AA. Uh, and it's a, it, it is not AA, and I am clear on that, but it is a clubhouse where AA meetings happen, and it's a clubhouse for And it's been there a really, really, before the traditions, you know, I mean, that's how old this place is. And it's this big mansion place, and and it it has an interesting history. It is uh, on the National Historic, you know, Society building because of the architect. But the thing I found interesting is the, the owner of the house who had it built, his wife, it has a Titanic connection she survived the titanic you know so i mean just stuff like that makes things interesting remember i told you i like information okay so she takes me in this place and it's friday night and let me tell you there was not much difference between friday night in the psych ward and friday night at oak street (laughs) there really wasn't But this woman took me to my first beginner's class, and she told me what to do, and I want you to know, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself, and I can't tell you clearly what was going on with me in my beginning of my my sobriety, because I don't know, because I was too crazy and consumed with fear, and all I know is that I kept showing up. I kept going to 405 Oak Street. I kept going to the meetings. I went to as many meetings as I could go to, uh, job, no job place to live, no place to live. And 30 days in, it was like, I'm 30 days in. And these women come from this place and they say, oh, we're having an open house. Oh, good. Why don't you come? They say, okay, I'll go. I go to the open house. Well, the open house was for professionals. I definitely was not a professional. They looked at me, and they were very kind to me, and they took me aside, and they made an appointment for me to come in and be admitted. (laughs) And I spent, it was a six-week program. I was 30 days sober, and they kept me eight weeks. There were women coming in that were in and out in their time slot, not me. I got no weekends out because I had nobody that would come get me. I didn't know anyone in AA enough that they would come get me. I had no family. So I got personalized recovery from women that were in AA who happened to actually work this place, you know, on the weekends. It was me. I graduated. My parents were so happy that I graduated from something. And this, this is an absolute true story. I, my father said, have somebody go to the airport. So he told me when they were coming, I sent them down there, and they came back. And they came back with 
live lobsters for everybody. (laughs) So here I am in Cincinnati. I'm graduating from alcoholism. (laughs) You know, from this place. And we have a going away lobster dinner. Cooked by me because the person who was the cook there didn't know how to cook lobster. It was just, I mean, just funny, funny stuff. I think about it sometimes. Here's what I know. Alcoholics Anonymous got a hold of me and really got a hold of me inside. There was something about what they said to me. I don't know why I believed them. I don't know why I kept coming. I can't answer the whys. And the whys in the long run have meant little to me. Okay. What has meant more to me is what solution is here for me? What hope is here for me? Who has gone through this before that can help me? And now what helps me is that now I really get it's okay for me to help others. When I have done the work for me, you know, and I do it regularly and I do it every day. And and I think about, I have this program of recovery that really is today. What am I doing today for my sobriety? What am I doing today? I am lucky I got blessed with some people in like. They didn't know what to do with me, I think, because I came in. Remember I told you I was all of those kind of things, involved in all of those things. So the sacred text of Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, really, I mean, let's face it. That's how we, so I would open up the book, and every place it said he, I changed the word to she, and every place it said God, I said goddess, this is 1980, and they're like, what are we going to do with her? She obviously needs us. I think they had talks about me. I would also tell you that I had a nickname. Okay? I had a nickname. They gave me a nickname. The nickname was, and I'm going to cuss, so I'm going to warn you, because this is what they called me. Fuck you, Noreen. <laughs> It's the only time you're going to hear me say it tonight, but that is what they call me. That is how I treat it. That is what was an adjective, an adverb, a noun. It was everything in my vocabulary, okay? It was everything. And they still were willing to give me the life-giving program of recovery that they did, despite how different or mean, or arrogant, or any of those things that, you know, despite my resistance, despite my defiance, despite the fact that I might have come off like, I don't need your help, they still gave me what I needed to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not have to think like them. I did not have to act like them. All I simply had to do was be someone that was in need, that had a desire I had a desire to stop drinking. And that's all I needed from those folks who really didn't care for me. But here's what I know. Despite there were people there that didn't care for me, they still were willing to go the next step for me because I was there to be a recovering person. I was lucky. I got involved in a home group. I I happened to get involved in several different kinds of groups of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was um, in what I would say special composition, special composition groups, women's groups, gay and lesbian groups, because by the way, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, by then I was only dating women. And those groups... And the regular groups, the big book, and the 12 and 12 groups that I went to, the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous allowed me to learn and to grow and to become a person who could show up, who could be committed, who could... They gave me things like, don't say no to an AA request. That served me well. I was in a relationship that was violent, and he had hit me that night, and I had a commitment, and the person came to get me, and I went out to that commitment. What I'm saying to you is they taught me little things that made a difference. 
you know. And my life was not wonderful. It was not all joyous. It was not any of those things. I have a long road of, of recovery in what sobriety would be. You know, and it varied. Sometimes I was doing really great, and sometimes I wasn't doing so great. And yet there was always members of Alcoholics Anonymous there that were willing to help me. Not give me everything, but to help me. To show me the way, to take my hand, to show me how to do those 12 steps. To show me in the book, in the 12 and 12, to show me in the literature What would help me? To show me in their lives, because they unfolded their lives to me in a way that I never would have unfolded my life to them. I would not have been able to do that. They unfolded their lives. They they shined the light on what their life was like for me. So that I could live. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous does. At least for me it did. It did for me. And I'm not anybody. And here's what I got. Because I was willing to be a part of groups and home groups and be committed and show up, I got to have some amazing things happen. I got to form and develop relationships with other human beings. I got to learn how to communicate and to share what I was feeling. I got to identify them. I don't know about you, but I was like that little kid who had the, the feelings chart on the refrigerator. I really did. It's like, that's it. I had to look at the face. I couldn't connect those things. I, had, I was remedial. You know, I really, I was remedial. You had to do that stuff with me. And I got to show up, and I learned how to show up early at the meeting and be a part of it and clean up and all of that stuff. You know, and I I got to learn how to chair a meeting and to read in public. Because I tell you, when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I've always been right and I'm a reader, right? But I couldn't read and retain anything. I couldn't even read a sentence and really keep it. It wasn't staying. So I needed, I was one of those people that, that needed a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every day. And if I could, I did more. And I was also one of those people that nobody would hire to do anything. So I was like, ooh, you know what I mean? What am I going to do? And people in home groups I was part of and people in the Al-Anon Fellowship, who I thank so much for my life because they helped me also. They allowed me to have a little dignity by doing some work for them. And uh, then started to learn how to go out and look for a job and get a job and do that kind of stuff. That's, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous did for me, you know? And I want you to know, I laughed and said I was the first electrician. Well, we went on from there. We have a little litany. I, w- I was, I, I was um, and able to um, work as an elevator constructor. I've been an operating engineer. i <laughs> I've had it. It's been interesting. It's it's been an unfolding. Now I did a, a lot of this stuff. I I climbed poles for Time Warner. I was the first woman on the line out. And, you know, um, I worked in power plants for for the um, what is now Duke Energy. Um, I just got to do a lot of things, you know, and that's an that's an adventure for me. That was part of the adventure. I also found out that maybe that isn't always the place for me to be. Just because I had a resentment didn't mean I had to go out and do that stuff all the time, you know? Uh, I enjoyed it for a period of time, and I I did hurt my back, and I thought, hmm, I'm probably in my 30s. Maybe I was, you know, maybe I don't need to be doing this. Because I got sober when I was 28. Relatively new, young people's groups, all that stuff. It was fun. I had fun because I finally started to connect with with people that knew and understood me, that opened their hearts to me, and I was able to open my heart to others. That, to me, has been the magic here in Alcoholics Anonymous. People unfolded to me, and what they did for me, I'm able to do for somebody else. Experience, strength, and hope. 
Take my hand. I will show you what worked for me. I can do no more than that. I can do no more than that. I will love you. I will support you. You have to take the actions. You know, I had to take the actions. I can show what worked for me. You don't have to do. You know what? You don't have to have the same higher power I do. That's why I love this place. This is kind of got lots of options and choices that I didn't even know we had. You know, so I got to be an explorer. Anyone else been an explorer? Just an explorer to find out what other people do. Listen to them. What worked for them? How it worked? How that worked in their life? So they had a connection. And they got, I don't know about you, but when I was able to seek that and find that, I also found joy. I found security. I found love. That's what I found in the higher power that you allowed to unfold for me. Pretty cool. That's what I feel is my, my job in Alcoholics Anonymous, is to help other women mostly, although I have sponsored a guy or two for various reasons for shorter periods of time, um, help lead them through the 12 steps and the 12 traditions and the concepts and, 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 and to, to unfold the joy of service for them so that they can find their higher power that works for them in their life. And um, that's amazing to me that somebody like me who had, you know, mostly anti-beliefs, you know, mostly anti-beliefs, to have a joy and a, and a solid connection to something that I know that, I, an example, I told you when I came to AA, I was only dating women and I had relationships with women and they didn't work and all kinds of stuff. And so I thought, doing step work, I unfolded something. Oh, no, what am I going to do? I'm attracted to men. Oh, that was horrible. And I wasn't meaning that it was horrible, that it, but what was horrible about it was this. I was afraid again. I was afraid that this is who I was. I had a box. You know, I knew who I was. Everybody knew who I was. Who, how's that? I'm going to have to, oh, what am I going to do? So I did what any good alcoholic would do. At least I think so. I went out, I went out of town to have sex with a guy. Because I wanted to check it out before I let you knew that was really what I was going to be doing. <laughs> Just like people go out of town and sneak a drink. You know, because I, I was afraid. I was afraid. I, I, you know, so fear I, I, reveals itself again sometimes, you know. But I got exactly what I needed in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what that was was people that loved me no matter what. My home group at the time was the Queen City group of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a gay and lesbian group in in Cincinnati, Ohio. And they loved me because they didn't really care. They They were Alcoholics Anonymous. What they cared about is what do you need to do to stay sober? And if it happens to be abandoning us and sleeping with men, you know, I mean, then so be it. I would be less than honest. I'm telling you, this is truth right out of my my experience in AA. I I don't think I can make this stuff up. (laughs) So I I was I met this guy. This this he asked me to marry him. I just no 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 got married. You know what I mean? It's okay okay (laughs) got married. So I'm married, and then about a year later, I have um, a child. So I'm in my 30s now, and I'm I'm now like six years sober, and and it's like, and then life starts to go to crap. Because he decides he's not going to do things that he needs to do in order to maintain his life, and then you know, it's like, things got bad, um, so bad that my son was three years old, and at the time, my this is sober. You know, my now deceased, but ex, you know, deceased husband put a knife to my throat, pulled the window out of the car and held my three year old hostage. 
I want to tell you that you all have been so magical for me because you gave me something that allowed me to be different than that person. Remember I told you I was a toe-to-toe kind of girl? I was toe-to-toe, but I was able to look into his eyes and I could see the look of sheer terror. I could see that he was a man filled with fear. And I'll tell you what else I had learned from you all. I had learned how to breathe in. Breathe in a power that works under all conditions. I could be in contact with that power. I could be there right then at that moment and, and it, because that's how you taught me to be. When there was something wrong, you had offered me a way to be connected with a power greater than myself that at that moment filled me with, you're okay, Noreen. No, I don't know what his actions were going to be. I really didn't. But what I can tell you is at that moment, I could see he was terrorized. At that moment, I felt like I would be okay. He went in the house, and I did lie to him. I said I'd be there when he got back from work that day, not. Uh, You taught me to be sane about some things. I didn't have to stay in that kind of crazy stuff. So I didn't. But here's the thing. You taught me how to live. You taught me how to handle situations that used to baffle me. Isn't that what somebody said in in those promises? I got that from you. I got that from you. You taught me that. And it wasn't just words, because I took what you taught me in words and actions and used it in pretty crisis situations in my life and found out that what you said worked over and over and over again. Tell you what else, because I could see this man was terrorized, although I left and I divorced and all of that stuff, I did not have to hate him. I did not have to say anything awful, terrible, mean, rotten, anything to my son about his father ever. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm standing before you and I am not telling you a lie. Ever. I did not have to do it. Because this is what unfolded. One time I'm in the car, my husband's in the car, my mother had come to visit, and we're all in the car, and my son's in the car, and we're driving down the road, and my son from the back seat says, you know, Mom, my dad says that you're a liar, cheating a thief. said, really, Brendan? Yeah, yeah, Jimmy, you too. And Grandma? You too, Grandma. said, oh. And I was able to do that breathing that you taught me. And I was able to look at my son, turn around and look at him and said, it must be so hard for you to hear someone you love say things like that about people you love. Where does that come from? It does not come from this smart, mm -mm, you know what I mean? It doesn't come from me. Where does that come from? And it's amazing. You know, my son... um, has taught me a lot of things. He's um, 27 now. I got married again in Alcoholics Anonymous to a man that I met my very first day in Alcoholics Anonymous. We did service work together. And my my very first meeting, when that woman took me off the psych ward, remember that person? That's who he met. And I said... He introduced himself because that's what good members of Alcoholics Anonymous were taught to do where I was. And so, because not everybody, you know, that's what they're taught. So he introduced himself. And that's it. I don't like you. I don't like men. I don't like anything that, about, you know, and it's like, and um, especially pieces of your anatomy. <laughs> Now, let's face it, folks, I knew nothing about any of this, you know. But here's the deal. He was someone that I got to know during service work. He was somebody that I got to see unfold in his life the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, just as I had seen it happen in mine. And um, we started a journey together, and um, 
How he puts it is this. I'll tell you how he puts it. So Jimmy puts it like this. He asked me out on a date. And I said, you want to go on a date, Jimmy? He said, yeah, I want to go on a date. Well, if you want to take me to movies, you want to take me to dinner, things like that, we can do that. But I want you to know the rules. And he said, rules? <laughs> yeah, rules. I've known you a long time. I've seen you operate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't want to be one of your statistics, so here are the rules. If you want to take me out to dinner, you want to go to a movie, you want to do those things, go to AA events, great. We can do that. But there's not going to be any sex. Hmm. He says we went out on dates. He didn't know whether to kiss me goodnight or say the serenity prayer. (laughs) And he also tells everybody six months later he won. (laughs) Our life together hasn't always been easy. We both have had problems. We've both always been able to connect to the solution. So life doesn't always go the way you want. Have a son that died, died of our disease. I I was his stepmother. But I was the one that got to be with him. I didn't bring him into this world, but I got to be with him when he had his last breath. I was the one that he trusted enough to ask me to make sure certain things were done. I'm the one he asked. I don't know how anyone like me gets that kind of connection with some other human being. That trust from from somebody who couldn't stay sober, you know? But he knew... I'll tell you what I believe he knew. He knew I loved him. He knew I cared about him. And he believed that if he asked me to do something, if it was in my power, I would do it. And I did get to be there with him. All I know is, again, it says intuitively know how to handle situations. That night I said, Jimmy, I'm sitting next to him. I'm staying up tonight and I'm taking the chair next to him. And that was the night he had his last breath. Intuitively, no. I don't, you know. That's what I know. I am blessed. My husband, I told you I'd tell you a little bit about the, we are, I believe, a product of Alcoholics Anonymous. How many other places do you have the combat Vietnam veteran and the war protester? <laughs> married, living relatively happily, (laughs) you know, together, and caring about each other. That's, you know, that's what I've gotten. You know, I said I wasn't capable of being with somebody that's loving and kind, despite our problems, you know, and every human being has human problems. Every relationship has its difficulties and, and journey to get through. But I absolutely, without a doubt, have something that I never had before with my husband. And that is, I know he loves me. <sighs> never. Never. People could have said it till they were blue in the face. They could have. It's because of what AA changed in me that I'm now allowed to believe when I really hear the truth. That unfolds for me. One of the things about Jimmy is he's 100% permanent disabled. And because of that, I get benefits. One of the benefits were my son was raised, he was out of the house, and I had always tried to go to school, to graduate from college and things, and I couldn't do it. Either I couldn't do it head-wise, there was too much going on, there was too much chaos going on. Um, I mean, uh, there was a time when, you know, this divorce thing was going on, and I was trying to go to school. Just none of that stuff worked. And I learned that when 
things are like that, I don't have to try and force them to work. You know, so I learned to withdraw. You know, I actually could do it officially. I never knew that before. So you could like go in and say, hey, I can't do this right now. And they let you withdraw and there's not consequences in that regard. And so I did that. 2005. I went back to school. I had no degree in 2005. In 2006, I had an associate's degree. In 2008, I had a bachelor's degree. And in 2009, I had a master's degree. And just this summer, I became a licensed independent social worker, which to me is amazing because that's not something that... I didn't think I'd ever be able to do anything, if you know what I'm saying. It just wasn't going to happen. And um, and here's here's something funny about it. So I'm in school, and I'm in class, and I'm walking down campus, and I hear, Hey, Brendan's mom! <laughs> because I was able to be home during my son being raised, <laughs> I was the parent at school. So I actually was in school in college, in classes with kids that I had been the parent, the parent-teacher assistant, that was me, and they would say things like, oh, I remember, and I said, what do you remember? Say, oh, yeah, I remember you had us doing head, shoulders, knees, and toes in Japanese. (laughs) I mean, just funny stuff, you know, you never know how that is, but you know what? I got to enjoy life. I got to have life unfold. What I have not talked much about is the thing for me that gives me, besides my higher power, gives the most joy, and that is working with other women. That, to me, is really the thing that does it for me. What can I do to be of service? How can my life, as it unfolds, help another drunk? Because that's what I want to do. I just want to help. You know, I think I told you that from the beginning. And I want to help. What can I do? I recognize fully because of, thank you very much, Al-Anon, that I can't do it for them, (laughs) you know, Um, that there is a program, that program helped me a lot to help put me in right perspective also. And I don't know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the power of healing that is in these rooms. I love the connection and the openness and the honesty. And the way that I got those places was that I was given someone who was willing to help me learn the principles, the spiritual principles of the steps and and the traditions and the concepts. They taught me about, it's not about me and a commitment. And um, commitment. Not just to me, not just to AA, but commitment to someone in need. And that always is not the new person in the room. I'm not saying they don't need our help, but there are many people in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous who need help. You know, and that, that's for me is my job. And, um, I just want to thank you all for allowing me to be here. Um, I do have one more thing I want to tell you. Because of Connecticut's Alcoholics Anonymous, I had AA at my father's funeral and my father's burial. I live in Cincinnati. I had no one. But people from Connecticut came up to my father's funeral in Boston, and they stayed with me during his burial. And you all, will forever be in my heart. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.